last uh, lecture in this uh, session will be Cecil, state of the art lecture uh, about hepatitis C uh, uh, virus infection from discovery to uh, cure by uh, prof uh, Professor uh, Mark uh, Solkowski. Uh, professor uh, Mark Solkowski is a professor of medicine. He is the medical uh, director, uh, director uh, viral hepatitis center, John uh, Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, Baltimore, uh, Maryland, United States of America. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this overview of hepatitis C from discovery to cure. The way I frame this discussion is really to put it in the context of the spectrum of clinical and translational research. In the United States, the National Institutes of Health has defined this spectrum research from going from basic science translations to our left to population health all the way to the right. And what I'll talk about is over the last 25 years, we have moved from the discovery of hepatitis C to a time where we're talking about the elimination of this disease in segments of the population. So I'll first focus on the basic science discovery, move into the early clinical work, and end with a discussion about efforts to eliminate hepatitis C in many regions of the world. This was initially recognized as non-A, non-B hepatitis as early as the 1970s. It was clear that the blood supply was contaminated with the pathogen, although what that pathogen was was unknown. It was identified in a sentinel paper in Science in 1989, one of the first times a pathogen was found using a cDNA clonal technique or molecular techniques. We now know this is a flavivirus with a very high replication rate of nearly 10 to the 12 virions per day and a high mutation rate. The other fact is that human beings are the natural host of this infection, and as I'll discuss, that limited our ability to understand uh, how to treat this pathogen. The next series of scientific breakthroughs came in the late 1990s. It was difficult to study new drugs without an animal model, without an easy model to test medications. But in 1989, in science, the subgenomic replicon was developed. This took the non-structural proteins, hepatitis C, like the protease, and inserted it into a laboratory-based model that allowed for drug screening. Uh, several years later, there was actually the, the discovery of an infectious clone that could replicate the entire virus life cycle. Later, we learned that the human immune system can actually eradicate hepatitis C. Some patients, those who are genetically predisposed through a polymorphism at IL-28B can clear this virus spontaneously. What this figure depicts from David Thomas at Johns Hopkins, with whom I work, is individuals with this IL-28B CC haplotype were more likely to clear the infection. So this leads me to the final point in the basic science discussion, that this is a curable infection. Unlike other chronic pathogens, HIV and hepatitis B, both HIV and hepatitis B have a stable genome. In the case of hepatitis B, it's a CCC DNA that really defies antiviral medication. In the case of hepatitis C, there is no stable genome. This virus survives by essentially outrunning the immune system through a very high mutation rate. In essence, we know from the basic science of this virus that it can, in fact, be cured. The additional proof of this cure of hepatitis C comes from studies looking at individuals who achieved what's known as a sustained virologic response, no virus in the blood following treatment. If we look at a meta-analysis published in uh, 2015, individuals who were cured have a lower risk of mortality, inclusive of liver failure, liver cancer, and death, than individuals who were not cured. So we believe that there are 
benefits of survival as well as clinical benefits of decreased risk of liver failure with treatment. The next steps of breakthroughs came from really understanding the life cycle. I mentioned in 2005 the infectious clone became available. This allowed scientists to understand how the virus enters the hepatocyte depicted here in this cartoon and to understand the steps in the viral life cycle. I'm going to focus on several of these steps, including the translation, the protease cleavage, which has led to protease inhibitors, as well as the NS5B polymerase, which is the main, one of the main targets of antiviral therapies. I'll also discuss the NS5A lipoprotein, which is a remarkable protein within the virus that's involved both in replication as well as the assembly and release. I won't mention some of the cellular targets, but we know the virus actually uses human MIR-122 and cyclophilin in its replication cycle. So the very first target that was investigated was protease. The protease cleaves a polyprotein produced very early in the life cycle. In 2003 in Nature, there was the publication of a drug called BILN 2061. Just one day of dosing delivered a more than four log decline in virus. Unfortunately, this particular drug caused liver, uh, I'm sorry, cardiac toxicity in, in monkeys when studied and was not taken forward. It was later that telapavir, depicted in the upper right, was developed. But one of the first things observed in a 14-day trial where patients took telapavir alone was that resistance occurred very quickly. The medication selected for resistant variants, and it was recognized that this drug could not be given alone. One of the next drugs targets to be investigated was the NS5A, a remarkable target. To the left is the paper in Nature in 2010. Individuals in this study took a single dose of the NS5A inhibitor Diclatisvir. After taking one dose, within 12 hours, there was a four-log decline in virus. And this decline was sustained over a period of nearly seven days. So a remarkably potent and rapidly acting class of medications. To the right is depicted a couple of the problems with this class. The first is that in patients receiving monotherapy, much like the protease, resistance to NS5A inhibitors is selected very rapidly. In the bottom right is a figure depicting the current NS5A inhibitors, Diclatisvir, Lidipasvir, and Abitasvir, part of regimens that are being used. They have cross resistance. If one of these drugs no longer works, then you've lost the other ones in that patient. I'll mention briefly polymerase inhibitors that are non-nucleosides. There's only one in development, or one in use, I should say, that is Dusabavir. This is part of the 3D regimen from AbbVie. What I wanted to point out with respect to Dusabavir is it acts on the polymerase, the enzyme that copies the single-stranded RNA, at the external sites, the so-called thumb, palm, and finger sites, not at the active site where the nucleotide analogs of phosphor that I'll discuss works. The other point to make is depicted to the right. This is a relatively weak antiviral when given alone. Over three days, there was a one log suppression of virus. Compare that to three or four log with protease and NS5A inhibitors. Yet in this phase two clinical trial, putting these drugs together, taking one drug from each category of antivirals, a protease like paratapavir, and NS5A like ambitasvir, the non-nuke desabavir, and one of our older drugs, ribavirin. We can see if we put all these together for a period of 12 weeks, 96% of patients achieved a SVR or cure. This study also very nicely showed the contribution of each drug. To the left, if you remove the NS5A inhibitor, 12% of patients relapse. If you remove Dasabavir, which I mentioned was a relatively weak antiviral, 10% relapse. And if ribavirin is removed, 7.6%. So this regimen works best when all drugs are put together, and we'll talk a bit more about that. 
The other thing this study demonstrates is the role of ribavirin. Now we've moved very quickly away from interferon, in fact I'll only mention it briefly a bit later, but ribavirin has a critical role and what it does in antiviral therapy is shown here. Ribavirin prevents viral resistance and viral breakthrough. So in a study of tilapavir plus interferon called PROVE2, published uh, uh, some time ago in 2009, if ribavirin was given, the breakthrough rate was only 1%. But if ribavirin was removed, it was 24%. So one of the things that ribavirin is doing is preventing viral breakthrough or viral resistance. And to this day, we don't fully understand how ribavirin works. And what we saw in registration trials for the so-called 3D regimen of ombitasvir, paratapavir, dusabavir is that patients with 1B do not require ribavirin, but patients with 1A, if ribavirin is removed, there were 16 patients with virologic failure compared to only two. Now this is also true of genotype 4 infection where the addition of ribavirin lowers the likelihood of viral failure in a genotype 4 infected patient. Now there is another regimen that's coming with respect to putting together a protease inhibitor, in this case grisopavir, and a NS5A inhibitor, in this case elbozavir. This is a single tablet regimen. This regimen will be approved by the US FDA next week and will represent yet another option for treatment. In this study of treatment-naive cirrhotic and non-cirrhotic patients, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, patients with genotype 1, 4, and 6 responded very well to a 12-week course of this one-tablet, once-a-day regimen with an overall SVR rate of 95%. So these are regimens that do not include a nucleotide analog polymerase inhibitor. But the nucleotide analog polymerase inhibitor, sofosbuvir, is truly an important drug in the face of hepatitis C, and the WHO has determined this to be an essential medication. Part of the reason why it's an essential medication or why it's so important in hepatitis C is shown to the right. In New Zealand, Professor Gain gave sofosbuvir by itself as a monotherapy for up to 12 weeks. Now that treatment was not the most effective regimen. In fact, we never used sofosbuvir alone. But viral breakthrough did not occur after a prolonged monotherapy. With every other class of drugs, protease, NS5A, and the non-nuke polymerase, breakthrough would occur within days of monotherapy. So this drug has what's known as a high barrier resistance. It's difficult for the virus to escape. And to date, this is the only nucleotide analog polymerase inhibitor that's really been in uh, approval and being used around the world. There is another from Merck that is in phase two clinical trials as we speak. This slide depicts how rare resistance to sofosbuvir is. In a study presented at the WSLD meeting uh, last fall, pre-treatment, no patient had resistance. In looking at 12,000 patients treated in clinical trials and deep sequencing 900 who had failed, only 10 had re evidence of resistance to sofosbuvir. That's less than 0.1% of all patients treated. So when this drug is combined with an NS5A inhibitor like ledipasvir, a very potent drug with a low barrier to resistance, it performs very well. These are the ion studies, 8, 12, or 24 weeks of the single tablet regimen of ledipasvir sofosbuvir, and you can see very high response rates. Overall, 97%. Eight weeks of therapy was effective in those with lower viral loads. Now, there is yet another version of a single tablet regimen of sofosbuvir, this time with velpatasvir. These studies, known as the astral studies, were just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what this slide depicts is data from astral one, two, and three. 
Velpatisvir is a second generation NS5A inhibitor that's active against all genotypes that have been identified on the planet. In fact, in this study, there was a single patient found to have genotype 7, and that patient was cured. So you can see the overall SVR rate was 98%, ranging from 95% in genotype 3 to 98% in genotype 1 and 100% in genotype 4 infection. So this will be a single tablet that can be used in patients with multiple strains of hepatitis C, ranging from genotype 1 through 6. And this should be approved in many parts of the world later this calendar year. Importantly, the side effect profile in the astral studies of soft vel versus placebo was quite benign. Headache, fatigue, nausea, insomnia were reported. However, these same side effects were reported among patients taking placebo. So the headache incidence was no different in both groups. So we now have many safe and effective options. This slide depicts the type of regimens being used around the world. Along the top two rows, you have what I would call nuke sparing regimens. These do not include the nucleoside or nucleotide analog NS5B inhibitor. And then we have a series of regimens that include a nuke. Along the bottom row is the next wave of therapies. These will be a nuke plus an NS5A plus a protease in a single tablet. One tablet with three different methods of action and will likely mean that patients can be treated, including those who have failed prior regimens. So over the past 25 years, there's been the highly successful translation from the basic science depicted in the uh, cartoon to the left of the virus life cycle to articles published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. Of 3,826 patients published in that, in that journal, 96% were cured. So this is extraordinarily effective translation in just a period of 25 years. The next question is, can these successes go from a clinical trial where patients are carefully selected, they're placed at expert centers, can that be replicated in the community? Can we in our practices treat our patients and achieve these same outcomes? Well, this is what the advancement in treatment looks like from the early uh, 1990s where interferon alone was used. We cured only about 15% of patients. And today, we're now talking about an overall cure rate of 97% in just 12 weeks of therapy. So the treatment has gone from interferon-based for one year to interferon-free for three months or less. Now, the biggest problem in translating from clinical trials to the community has been interferon. Interferon did not perform well in clinical practice for two reasons. First, interferon is patient-dependent. The same IL-28B that predicts spontaneous clearance predicts whether interferon will work for your patient. What this paper from Nature in 2009 shows is that if you have the favorable polymorphism, IL-28BCC, you could be cured 80% of the time with interferon. But if you had the unfavorable polymorphism, TT or TC, only 40% or less. But the other problem was tolerability. Both doctors and patients did not like interferon because of the side effects. And many patients were reluctant to take interferon or experience serious side effects during taking that. But the important information is that when we translate this into clinical practice, we're now doing better. So that same progression of cure can be seen in primary care centers in the state of New York. Now, these were centers that treated high-risk patient populations. And what it shows is the cure rate with interferon, about 55%. And if we go to the right of the figure, in the era of ombitasvir, peritapivir, ritonavir, and lidipasvir, sofosbuvir, 
they're now curing 95 percent. So the same advance is being recognized in clinical practice. And the figure to the right looks a lot like that figure I showed you from the trials of higher response rates over the past five years. In a clinical cohort, a prospective cohort called HCV Target, where clinicians in the United States, as well as some in Europe and other parts of the world, enroll patients, we see in our practices that 97% of patients are being cured. So in other words, these clinical trial findings of 97% are being replicated in real world clinical practices. And that suggests that the type three translation has been highly successful. Which brings us to where we are today, which is type four translation. Can we take these extraordinarily effective medications and address what is a global problem of hepatitis C, where there is a high morbidity and mortality rate, and can we improve global health? Well, the challenge is daunting. This figure depicts the hepatitis C infections around the globe. It's estimated 150 million people are infected and around 350,000 die each year. You can also see the heterogeneity of genotypes. In some regions, we see a highly prevalent genotype 4. In others, we see genotype 3, such as India. And we see genotype 6 in parts of Southeast Asia. And genotype 1 representing a dominant pathogen around the world. So we need drugs that work against all these genotypes. But we also have millions, if not tens of millions, of patients that need to be treated. When we look at the impact of viral hepatitis, this was an estimate that came in 2010 called the global burden of disease. Viral hepatitis leads to as many deaths per year in this study, estimated about 1.2 million, as HIV, more than TB or malaria. This is an important pathogen we need to deal with. In the United States, the Centers for Disease Control has published data looking at hepatitis C-related deaths. In the yellow, you can see that the number of Americans dying of hepatitis C is actually increasing over time. Those dying of HIV is decreasing. So we are, at this point, losing the battle against hepatitis C disease. And the United States is not alone. When we look at the treatment rates on the vertical axis, and the diagnosis rates on the horizontal axis, in many parts of the world, very few patients have been diagnosed. You can see that of the countries that have diagnosed more than 50% of their patients, it's really only a handful, France, Sweden, Canada, Australia, among others. But the treatment rates are below 6% across the spectrum of economies and countries. So very few patients have been diagnosed and very few patients have been treated to date. And what this cartoon depicts is you can have the most effective therapy in the world that cures 90% of patients, but if the treatment uptake rate, which is the second row, remains low at 10%, only 9% of the infected patients will achieve cure. So in order to impact global health or the health in a region or country, not only does the treatment have to be effective, and we've achieved that, but the treatment uptake has to be higher. And this cartoon shows you what happens if 90% of patients are diagnosed and treated, then the cure rate is 81% of the population. So the emphasis needs to shift to diagnosis and linkage to care. So this was a slide shown at a recent meeting in the United States that looked at the number of people in the world who have taken sofosbuvir in late 2015. It's roughly 500,000. So treatment uptake has been very vigorous. You can see it going up. But when we take the number 500,000 and compare that to 150 million people in the world, we see that's only a small number of patients have been treated, and there's much work to be done. So recently, the WHO has announced a 
global health sector strategy for hepatitis C. They want to expand and enhance services to diagnose more than 90% of patients and to treat more than 90% with cure of more than 90% of those patients. And if they can achieve these benchmarks, there'll be a reduction in new infections, so the incidence of hepatitis C will drop by 90%, and there'll be a 60% reduction in hepatitis C death rates. And these are goals for targeting about 15 years from now in 2030. There is a lot of work to be done to achieve this uh, aspiration of diagnosis and treatment of 90%, but it does have the potential ability to impact the global impact of hepatitis C. So to summarize what I've talked about, the last 25 years have in many ways been an a incredibly successful or triumphant translation of research. We've gone from the scientific discovery of the virus in 1989 to a time where the WHO is talking about global control of hepatitis C in just 25 years. This is a major cause of medical morbidity and mortality, and this disease can be cured. We now have highly effective oral regimens that target the virus directly. They're both safe, tolerable, and highly effective. And if we can treat patients, we know that in clinical practice, more than 95% will be cured. Yet we're faced with this, this challenge, and that is how do we take these effective therapies to a population level effectiveness, and that will take more than antiviral drugs. And finally, I'd like to thank our team at Johns Hopkins Hospital, where we're focused on trying to eliminate hepatitis C in our city, the city of Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor.